Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president. And it's my genuine personal pleasure on many levels to welcome Professor Steve, Stephen G. Cicchetti of Brandeis International Business School to present the fifth annual O. John O.K. Lecture on economics, ethics and economics here. The topic, finance for people, some do's and don'ts. Uh, before I turn to Steve, and it will become clear why he is a perfect person to give this lecture, I want to say a word about the person for whom this lecture is named, John Olkay. Uh, John, as many are aware in our little community, but not in the broader world, was a friend to monetary and financial policymakers and researchers for most of his life. He was a, uh, an innovator in financial markets. He was a trusted advisor to central banks and reserve management. But much more than that, he was a trusted advisor to many people, including myself, who made careers and tried to make a public contribution in the fields of monetary and financial policy. John came to this country and was a very proud American citizen um, but also was a globalist uh, in the best sense. He came from Turkey. He was of Christian background. Um, he lived and thrived in the UK. His daughter, um, Charlotte O.K. Hoagland, who's with us today, is running for parliament in the UK with her dual citizenship, and I know John would be extraordinarily proud of that. Uh, he wasn't just about research. He and his wife, Phoebe Miller, okay, who has also honored us with her presence today, uh, were known throughout uh, central banking circles and financial legal circles. But most of all, John was, not most of all, but most of all for purposes of this lecture, uh, solely that, was someone who combined the ideas of policy could do good in the world, strong analysis was the basis of policy, Monetary and financial issues were core issues to people's well-being, and we could work across borders to make that happen. And so he was an advisor and an encourager here at the Peterson Institute of our programs, and his many friends came together to endow this lecture series. As I mentioned, this is the fifth year of the series, and of course that means more than five years since John passed away. Um, but we do think this is an important part of his memory, as well as a highlight of the Institute's annual calendar. Uh, the previous OK lecturers here at the Institute include George Akerlof, Sheila Baer, Alan Blinder, and Eric Rosengren, a very heady group, as I hope all of you will agree, people at the intersection between policy and analysis who had deep ethical convictions. And in that regard, I am indeed happy to we got our first choice for this year's lecture, Steve Cicchetti. Now, Steve is officially the Rosen Chair in International Finance at Brandeis International Business School. He has been at the center of many policy areas. Uh, I didn't get to work for him, but I knew him well, and he was executive vice president and director of research at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York from 97 to 99. Prior to that, he was editor of the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking, which rose up to become the premier monetary policy related and banking policy related journal in the field under his leadership. And following that, from 2008 to 2013, at a critical period for the world economy, obviously, Steve was economic advisor and head of the Monetary and Economic Department at the Bank for International Settlements. Like John Olkay, he's very well known to the aficionados and perhaps not quite as well known to the broader world, although his blog with Kim Schoenholtz is probably the leading technical economics finance blog out there. Um, he continues to be a consultant and advisor to a number of central banks. Uh, he has recently joined the science, what is it called, the scientific advisory panel of the European Central Bank, uh, the European Systemic Risk Board. Um, and 
We are absolutely delighted to have him with us today. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, it's definitely my privilege to be here before you to deliver the fifth O. Oh, John O.K. lecture on ethics and economic policy and to follow the four prior uh, lecturers. Um, uh, today I want to discuss certain aspects of finance and the responsibility of economists and policymakers to help people make better decisions. Um, but before I get to the details, let me ma mention, uh, make a few general comments about ethics and economics. Um, when it comes to ethics, I think economists have a sort of strange handicap. Um, for the roughly the past 75 years or so, I would say, since um, I would say since Paul Samuelson created the economics uh, that that I know at least, and I think that many of us know, um, there's been a focus on efficiency. Um, and um, the question that's asked by most economists then at the base of their work is how is it that the price system is going to allocate resources to its most efficient uh, uses? In answering this question, um, economists rely on a concept that's known as Pareto optimality that most of you know about. Um, this, is th this is this thing originated by the 19th century Italian-born economist Vilfredo Pareto, um, who after he did this did not have a terribly distinguished uh, life, I think, given his political bent. Um, the idea behind this, though, is that an allocation is efficient so long as you can't make anyone better off without making someone worse off. Um, unfortunately, uh, and uh, that's the concept I think that drives economic analysis today, um, but Pareto optimality is consistent with some pretty bad allocations. It's actually consistent with slavery. Um, and, uh, and so I think we really, we really need to do something uh, about that. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be the person to do it, but I sure hope that, uh, that we can move away from this. Um, in the same vein, I think most economists or many economists, including me, have at least a modern sort of libertarian streak. We have this little libertarian living inside of us. Uh, sometimes it gets out a bit, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and, uh, and of course, from the perspective of a libertarian, the primary role of government is, uh, is to enforce property rights. And there's a focus then on personal responsibility. Um, people make rational decisions in their own interest. Um, if they don't, that's their problem. That's kind of the, the view. Um, I'm obviously exaggerating, but the point I think is, is that these ideas, the combination of Pareto optimality and the reliance on uh, the rationality of individual decisions, tends to push economists away from thinking about distributional issues and uh, in a way from, uh, from explicitly normative analysis. Um, I think this is unfortunate, and so I welcome the, this lecture and this series as a way to try and push against this to reinforce the importance of thinking about trade-offs uh, between efficiency and equity, um, which is something, as I said, uh, most of us don't spend enough time doing, and we certainly don't train our students how to do it. Um, but that's something that hopefully eventually will change. Um, so uh, ah, I changed the slides successfully. I just want I was warned about this sort of Anyway, never mind. Um, so finance, finance has evolved pretty dramatically uh, in our lifetimes. I recall the excitement that I had in the late 1970s when I managed to get a hold of my first ATM card from the Bank of America. Um, I was excited because it meant I didn't have to go in the bank anymore. Um, and uh, and I, I was the kind of person that dealing with the people in the bank was not something that I really found that, that 
that uh, enjoyable. So the fact that I could use the cash machine was great. Um, I also recall uh, roughly a decade later, you know, investing in various kinds of mutual funds and stuff. Um, uh, I, I don't remember exactly when it happened, but 10 years after that, sometime in the mid-1990s, we, you know, we were offered the ability to start doing online bill payment. I was always sort of like, I would always do these things as soon as I possibly could because they seemed interesting to me. Um, and, uh, and today we can, of course, send money to people using telephone numbers from our phones. Um, fortunately, I should say there are limits on that, um, but, uh, but we can definitely do it. And so the point is that personal finance has changed pretty dramatically. Um, not only that, but finance in general, sort of what, what you might think of as market or professional level finance, has changed quite a lot as well. And today can do things that you couldn't imagine doing 50 or 60 years ago. Um, importantly, in the terminology of a, of a financial economist, you can price basically any sequence of contingent claims. Um, for those of you that don't know what that means, the basics are you can price anything. Um, and, uh, and there's a technology out there basically to price anything. And that, that's very, very powerful. Um, but uh, as, the, as the sophistication and variety uh, of available services has increased, um, and the complexity and opacity of the available instruments rises, um, we're putting more and more responsibility on individuals. Um, and I think those things are, uh, that, that, that I think it raises a, a really question, a, a big question for me, because most of the people that are out there are really not capable, in my view, of making smart decisions about these things. This is not a statement about their inherent capacities. It's a statement about their abilities to handle finance. And so the question, or a big question for me, is is it right or is it ethical to ask people to make life-changing decisions that they're not equipped to make? Um, and so I'll come back to this. And in the remainder of my time, what I'm going to do is I want to start with some facts uh, about three things. I'll talk about financial literacy, I'll talk about conduct, and I'll talk about costs. Um, because, of course, this increase in sophistication has also led to some other pretty deep problems that you'll see. Um, I'll talk about why I think finance is good and where I think it's bad. Um, I'll mention a few things about conduct and costs, but then I'm going to move on to talk about three, the, what I think of as the three largest uh, decisions that people have to make, that we ask them to make uh, in their financial lives, and those are education, housing, and, um, and, and retirement. So, um, oh, I should note before I, uh, before I do this that, that this is, um, I realize that the, I'm at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and I think those of you that know me um, know that I tend, I try very hard not to be U.S. centric. Um, but this is a pretty U.S. centric talk because financial systems tend to be very, very domestic in the nature in which they operate, and the sorts of decisions that we ask people to make in a financial system tend to depend on exactly where those are. So it's hard to escape um, having to choose uh, sort of a, a domestic system. And, uh, and the one I know the best and where we're sitting today is the US one. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I want to start with three pretty striking facts. Some of you have probably seen some of this before. Um, is that legible? Um, okay, good, because um, I'm going to give you a second to read some of these questions. This is a basic financial literacy questionnaire, okay? So there's a question about simple, a simple interest rate question. This isn't even about compounding, okay? <laughs> there's a question about inflation and interest rates and their relationship. Um, there's a question about interest rates and bond prices. Um, there's a basic mortgage question, and then the final question is about diversification. Okay, so um, I would submit that if we ask someone to manage their finances, that they should be able to answer these questions. Okay, 
That seems pretty basic, but those of you that, I mean, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be even starting here if you didn't know that what it was. Okay, so um, oh, there is a there is a, so th these are these are like Anna Maria Lusardi's questions. There there's there's a sixth question where you need to know like the rule of seventy two to answer it. That one I like. That one's really that one's really complicated. I don't know why they put that one on. Um, so. You know, my hope is that none of you actually have to think very hard to answer any of these. Um, but here's the here are the answers, uh, at least from the 2019 version of this. Um, the 2019 version of this show you that um, that people do not do well on this. Okay, um, about a, about a quarter of the people don't really understand how interest rates work. Um, nearly half don't understand how it is that inflation is eroding their purchasing power uh, of their investment balances. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a bit less concerned about this bond price interest rate question. I wouldn't really bother to ask people that. I'm not sure why actually you, you need to know that one so much. Um, uh, the mortgage question is about 15 versus 30 year eight mortgages. They probably ought to kind of know that. But the most troubling one for me is the last one. Okay? Because again, remember, we're asking people to make a lot of their own investment decisions, but they don't understand diversification. Okay? The fraction of people that understand diversification is less than half. Right? So that's the first fact. Um, Moving on to something less having to do with, with individuals and literacy, um, these numbers I'm sure are familiar to many of you. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the, uh, this chart shows you uh, the cumulative level of fines for the top 50 banks that have been fined globally uh, since, the, since the financial crisis. Uh, so this is over the last decade roughly. Um, I guess I think those. I think some of those numbers are pretty big, um, you know. Um, and uh, now you know you look at those and you say, "Oh God, what was Bank of America doing?" Well, Bank of America sort of got screwed because it bought Countrywide, and um, they they had a lot of legacy problems. They do have problems of their own, okay. But um, but they also bought some things in the middle of the crisis that led to some of these fines. Um, but uh, you know, and then you might ask yourself, why is, why is Wells Fargo so far down on the list? Uh, that would be my that would be my question, you know. In, in fact, I would ask why Wells Fargo is still in business, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, but the the problem in finance is that because the war rewards are, are potentially so large, and it's so easy in principle to hide various kinds of min misconduct, the temptation for malfeasance is enormous. And to give you some sense of how enormous it is, um, in the United States, the value added in finance and insurance, this excludes real estate. For, so for some of you that look at numbers, sometimes the real estate is included in there. This excludes real estate. The value added is 7.5% of GDP. Okay, That's currently about $1.5 trillion. So that's the size of the pie that the finance and insurance industry has to divide up among the people working there. And so it doesn't take a very big slice of one and a half trillion dollars once for you to be pretty well set, okay? Um, I mean set to the point where you can afford a private plane. So it's, it's like, this is, this is really, this is a problem. Um, it's no wonder that people are always on the edge of what's ethical uh, given the, uh, and what's legal given the size of these, uh, of these rewards. Um, finally, there are costs. This picture, um, due to Thomas Philippon, um, I, every time I look at it, I find it just very hard to believe, but I'm, I'm sure it's right. Um, it shows the cost of intermediation as a, as a percent of total assets intermediated in the United States. My reading of this is that there's been very little change in that cost over the past 130 years. Okay? So that, that, picture starts in 1885. Um, the reason for the differences in color is that the, is that the frequency of the data change um, at that point. But it really doesn't matter what, what you look at. It just doesn't matter. The numbers are between, are like one and a half percent or so. 
Okay, this is pretty amazing, especially during the last 50 years when we witnessed such dramatic innovation. Okay, I mean, just think about the phones you all have in your pockets. And then I think as I look out there, my guess is most of you were, you know, you were also running around in the 1990s without phones in your pockets. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, you know, it's a, and, and also, I mean, I, I, I reflect occasionally on the panic that I have when I can't find my phone. So, um, but that's a different, that's a somewhat different issue. Um, now, granted, we're asking the financial system to do a lot more things for us and to do more complicated things, but this just seems unreasonable to me. Okay? The, this, this just looks like people are managing to collect rent. And, um, and I don't think it's, it, it still hasn't really changed much. You know, I think the most recent data, the sense in 2015, the most recent data might show a little tiny, like tiny little blip down further, but but not uh, but not much. So to summarize the three these three facts, most people don't understand finance. Not a huge surprise. Uh, the temptation for malfeasance is pervasive and large. Also not a huge surprise. <laughs> Maybe more surprising is technology has not lowered the unit cost of intermediation. Okay, that's maybe more surprising. So, um, so the policy challenge as I see it um, arises, we, we believe that finance can improve economic efficiency and improve general welfare. At the same time, it asks everyone to make complex decisions. Um, it's providing opportunities for fraud. And it sure looks like innovation's not driving down costs. So these are the three questions I think that we that we need to face. I don't have great answers, but I think that we need to think about them. Um, you know, how can we help people to make smart financial decisions? How can we reduce these opportunities uh, for misconduct? And how can we ensure that cost reductions actually accrue to customers? Um, now. Taking a step back just for a second, let me. I want to talk a little bit about why I think finance is good and when it's bad, and then I'll uh, then I'll make some suggestions on two of those. So it's important to emphasize that I think that finance really is, uh, in most circumstances, a, a pretty strong force for good. Um, it can and does usually improve individuals' lives. Um, people's, people with bank accounts um, have access to the payment system and can get loans. It promotes safekeeping. You know, imagine, th think about what happens in societies where people don't have ready access to banks. They're left with piles of, of bank notes sometimes, and those bank notes uh, issued by, country, by governments may or may not retain their value, and they're easily stolen. Um, and uh, it also facilitates saving and encourages saving. And it, it allows people to smooth their consumption then in the face of income volatility. These are pretty good things. Now, just to, just to mention one thing about this, during the past decade, there's been an enormous effort to increase inclusion in finance. Um, since 2011, which is when the World Bank began collecting data on this, the number of unbanked adults has fallen from two and a half billion to 1.7 billion. Given the fact that the number of adults has also grown, that's an enormous, uh, an enormous accomplishment because it means that since 2011, over a billion people have gained access. Now, this chart's a little bit different. This chart shows you um, that in developing countries, there's been a dramatic increase in, um, in access to finance, not only in the aggregate, but also among the disadvantaged and the least advantaged in our society. That's an, I think that's just a huge, huge accomplishment. Um, now, about half of this, I should say, is a consequence of what's going on in India. Um, in India, there's this public there's this public program that has managed to enroll something close to 400 million people in five years. It's it's just the more I every time I look at that, I just can't imagine that anybody succeeded in doing that. But the point here is that few consumer products have ever diffused this rapidly. Um, and uh, especially, I think, among the world's poor, the only other example is phones. Um, and phones did diffuse and have diffused extremely rapidly so that about 80% of adults in, uh, 
in, in, in developing countries today do have mobile phones. Those things are not unrelated because, of course, mobile phones can be used for financial access. So, um, so technology's helping. But this isn't what I'm really here to talk about today, but if you think about how you're going to do this, how you're going to improve access even further, it seems to me that the answer has to be a part, it's technology and government. I think it's very, very hard hard. The, the private sector is not going to do this. Um, now, continuing on with the good things, this is sort of like, you know, the textbook list uh, of what finance does. It channels savings to its most efficient uses, and it shifts risk to those who are most able to bear it. When you do these two things, you overall increase welfare. You increase production, you increase well-being generally. And then, of course, finance has lots of innovation. Now, innovation is supposed to do these three things. It's supposed to improve choice, seems to do some of that. It's supposed to increase information, which also it seems to do some of, although there's a question as to whether or not it's doing it in the right way. And finally, it reduces, uh, it reduces cost. Um, and, uh, and given that it exists in principle to counter various kinds of, uh, of frictions in the economy, this should help. Okay, And so this is one of the things that the, the fact that innovation doesn't actually reduce costs is increasingly surprising. So that's the good. What about the bad part of finance? Um, well, as I've already suggested, there's a natural tendency for finance to become opaque and complex. Um, now, w one, way to th one way to think about what finance is capable of doing is, is if you come out and you say you're going to ban blue securities, that people in the financial system will go to the paint store and buy green paint. Okay, And they're going to come in and they're going to paint everything that used to be blue green, and they're going to say, I don't have any more blue securities. Now I, all I have are green securities. And those securities, again, because of this ability to price and transform basically any stream of payments and any risks one into another and glue them together in different ways, this is not... Um, it's not that hard. People talk about rocket scientists, but trust me, on this one you don't need to be one. Uh, maybe pricing some of these things you do, but not for that. Um, but this facilitates exploitation. It, uh, it allows for mis-selling, and, and, uh, and, it, and it can even create opportunities for fraud as well. But more seriously, it allows people to conceal risk. And that's much more serious. Um, and um, so that's coming because the good part of the technology allows people to break things apart. And so this concealment can become concentration, but it can be out of the sight even of people who are very, very knowledgeable. And I think that's a, that's a huge issue. Um, next comes the problems associated with market power. Um, here, I, I actually have to say that, um, that uh, having spent a long time thinking about you know, writing international standards for financial regulation, th these things are part of the problem when it comes to market power as opposed to part of the solution. Um, regulatory compliance is inordinately expensive. Um, and I think it to the point today where it's become a significant barrier to entry into finance. Um, yes, it's true. We see a lot of these people called fintech companies who are trying to slice off little pieces, but they run into regulatory barriers very quickly. And so their exit most of the time is to get purchased by a financial intermediary that's already complying with the, with the rules. That's pretty much the business model that these, if you talk to these people, that's the business model that they have, right? They're starting something, they're showing you that it's profitable, and then the whole idea is that they're going to exit by selling it to an existing financial institution that has, um, that has the ability to, to meet capital and liquidity requirements, to do whatever the various kinds of testing and supervisory stuff is out there to meet anti-money laundering and, and know your customer rules um, and all that kind of stuff. New entry is just really, really tough. And this is actually, in my view, uh, protecting incumbents. Um, finally, of course, there's, there's fraud and predation, which I've mentioned several times. Um, and uh, and um, 
this doesn't just hurt individuals, of course, it also damages trust in the system as a whole. Um, I mean, all we have to do is think about what happened in 2008 and 2009 and the lack of trust, which I think is still, uh, is still with us to some degree and, and is, hurting, uh, is hurting us. Um, the other problem, of course, is that since the vis victims of fraud tend to be less sophisticated, this tend, they're, they're the easiest marks, this tends to perpetuate the skewness in the wealth distribution, which also then creates additional social problems. And sometimes these people are getting fleeced without even knowing it. And, uh, and so I think that that's a that's another thing. So what are we going to do about some of this? Um, addressing conduct and cost. Um, so first of all, I think that um, that we can start by encouraging additional disclo disclosure and more importantly even than that, product standardization. We have to work very hard at establishing practices that inhibit conflicts of interest um, and, punish, uh, and punish malfeasance um, I think aggressively, um, and by punishment here, um, I actually want to see people in jail. I think there's nothing quite like it, uh, and um, and I, I think that I think that the there's this silly idea. I mean, you know, we all know this, right? We're we're very harsh on certain crimes, but we're not harsh for some weird reason on other crimes. I mean, is there something like inherently? I mean, you know, these are not victimless crimes. OK, <laughs> but for some reason, if somebody breaks into your house and steals your television set there, you're going to get you're going to work hard to put them in jail. But if what they do is manage to bilk you out of like, you know, a couple thousand dollars somehow uh, and they did that to everybody in the room, uh, which, of course, they'll do because it's like, you know, scalable what they're doing, um, that for some reason that half the time doesn't deserve jail. Um, and. Uh, and I think that we need to change some of those things. We also need to change social norms and what it is that we expect from people. Um, and I think it's um, it's very important then to think about the things that that we that we are doing that maybe we should stop doing. So one of them we've I think we have largely stopped relying on self regulation. This is the libertarian solution, the belief that individual concerns and their for their reputations and the potential sanctions are going to lead to good behavior inherently. As I suggested, the rewards are just too big for that. Um, it's just worth it to take the risk. People are doing a cost-benefit analysis on this. It's not going to work. Um, we know it doesn't work. The other thing here is bright line regulation. Um, I think we have to think very hard about the way in which we, which we write our financial regulations. Um, and the reason is that when you think about the details of financial regulation, what I want you to keep in mind is that it's not just telling people what they sh can do, or I guess what they can't do, but it's telling them how to live up to the s letter of the law without living up to the spirit of the law. I think of these things as handbooks for cheating. Um, and I, I think that it's very important to think of bright line regulation that way. And so what we need here again is not just a, not just a, um, not just social norms, but also principles that we expect people to meet. Um, and we have to measure them that way. Um, so um, then I think the other two I think I've already discussed in some way. Let me move on now to talk about, spend the last, the remainder of the time talking about helping people make smart decisions. Um, and uh, looking, I want to look, as I suggested, at education, housing, and retirement. So starting with education, which is, uh, that's been in the news a lot, thanks to the Secretary of Education, I think, in part, um, and policies, and also, it makes for good, it also makes for good news, but there's, I think there's a reason for that, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, and, um, but first of all, student loans have, have tripled in volume in the last 15 years. Um, and, um, and so now they account for over 10% of household debt. That's not a huge number, but it's a, it's a reasonable size number. Uh, it's about 1.4, I think, trillion dollars. Um, but in my view, at least many student borrowers do not appear to be making sound financial choices. Um, and uh, and I, think that's, I think that's kind of our fault. 
collectively. So let me start here. This figure shows the distribution of 20-year net returns on a four-year college education net of earnings loss and financial aid. It accounts for financial aid. Okay? Um, so first, starting with this, the red line is for um, in-state college, right? Um, and uh, I think that the the bottom the bottom is uh, is the is the is this twenty year return at an annual rate. That's a pretty good deal. Okay, so in state colleges and universities look like a pretty look like a pretty good deal. Um, and uh, if you assume that there's a long run inflation of about two percent. It turns out that current loan rates for student loans, uh, if you do sort of a volume-weighted average, are approaching 6% nominal. They're pretty high. So that means that the, that, and this is all sort of a snapshot, so I can take the real return. It turns out the threshold here is four. I get to subtract the two from the from inflation. So what I really want to focus on is the fraction of, of these schools that are to the left of that dashed line. Those are the bad deals, okay? Now, I, I, should, I should also say that I'm not accounting for graduation rates here and that I do not have in this sample for-profit schools, okay? All I have are in-state and, uh, and I have state-run and I have private not-for-profits. For-profits would be like, they're probably not in the picture, okay? They're like to the left. There would be another big bump over there, all right? So we'll just, I'm gonna stipulate to the fact that those are generally not a good deal. Um, and given the experience that we've had, I think that's, uh, the, with, with um, there's, a, there's a lot of information that people who do borrow to, the go, to those generally default within about four years. Um, so, um, so if you look at this, um, there are 495 public schools in the sample that I have. 14 of them are worth the, are, are not worth the investment. So only 14 of them are to the left of the dashed line. That's almost everybody. So that, so if you're going to go to one of those, that's great. What's interesting to me is the blue line and the black line. So the blue line is out of state public colleges and the black line are the private colleges. And the first thing that jumps out at you is that they're like on top of each other almost. So that's really interesting because that means that the, that the state colleges are pricing themselves to be competitive with the private colleges and vice versa. That's, um, that's the market, okay? They're in the same market. Um, uh, so this is not an accident, I think, that they're on top of each other. But the other problem, the real problem here, turns out to be how much of this, the mass of this distribution is to the left of the line. So for the, for the private schools, there are 872 in the sample, 132 of them are to the left of the line. For the, um, and for the state ones, it's 68. Um, so those numbers strike me as, as being relatively unfortunate, I should say. Now, um, the second, my second point is that lots of loan, that lots of debt is not being repaid on schedule by students. This is data from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I've only given you every other year because I wanted to, I wanted you to see them. This is in terms of the number of borrowers. This is not dollar values. These are the number of people. Okay. And so the first thing to notice here is that we currently have something on the approaching 45 million borrowers. You know, that's a lot of people, okay? Um, but um, 17, uh, roughly 37% uh, roughly of those um, have falling balances and are actually repaying their loans. That's the black, okay? So if you look at a, if you look at a loan and you say, is your loan balance actually falling? Right? That would be a sign that you're repaying it. It's a sign that you're not in default and that you're not, there's no forbearance, right? Because if there's forbearance, you might see the you might see the thing either stable or rising. So the big problem here is the gray and the red. So the red is terrible. The red is the seven million people that are literally delinquent or in default. But the really shocking number is the one in the gray, and those are the people whose balances aren't falling. Okay? So this seems to me to be pretty. This seems to me to be pretty damning 
Um, and, um, and so the question is, the question is, what do we do about this? Now, as, as you think about student loans, I always, always, the first thought that you should have is, this is a government program. It is the government that is doing this to people, okay? This is not the private sector. It is being done by government programs. 90%, more than 90% of student loans are government, federal government loans, okay? Um, so one solution is to simply increase grants, just give people more, just give more outright grants. Um, this is sort of like not the economist's solution, you know, sort of the standard public finance problem of what's the incidence and stuff. Most people say, oh, if you do that, you're just going to drive the tuition levels up. You know, the, stu the students aren't going to actually help that much. You might as well just hand the money to the schools. Um, and to a certain degree, that's probably right. Beyond that, I see two things that we can do. Um, first, I think we have to stop subsidizing activities that make people worse off. Stop offering student loans to someone that has a high probability of default. Um, due either to their selection of a particular school, the people on the left of my distribution, um, or possibly even due to a course of study, because uh, there's a lot of variation in outcomes based on course of study. Uh, those loans are not improving their lives. Um, second, I think that we do need an appropriate safety net for students who do borrow. Um, career choice is risky, even if you make something that ex ante might seem reasonable. Um, and people can just get unlucky. Here the solution, I think, is that we need to shift to more income-linked contracts. Have people cap the amount that people pay in the number of years that they pay as a fraction of their income. Not, don't stop offering people just straight out loans that look like every other loan that has a fixed payment. See, student loans, I believe, are generally a force for good. Um, they do help many people acquire skills that they otherwise would not be able to afford, and they, as a consequence, they're made better off. A large, a large majority of cases, college does remain, I think, a good investment, and um, most people are actually able to handle the debt that they have, um, but many cannot. And Government programs, no matter how well-intentioned, in my view, should not create hardship for millions of people and their families. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, and we're, so again, so in fact, we're offering people very bad choices. Um, turning to housing, the largest asset for, middle for the middle class uh, is their home. Um, the far right-hand side, these are by income distribution, and these are portfolios. And the thing to focus on here is the size of the pink bar, which, as you can see, for the top 1% is very small. For the next 19% is modest in size. But for the 20th to 80th percentiles of the, uh, of the um, distribution is huge. Um, and uh, so the point here is that it's 60% that, that the middle 60% of these households housing represents 62% of their wealth and debt equals 59% of their net worth. So they're highly leveraged and they own homes and the homes are their primary asset. Now, um, leverage is generally in the form of a mortgage. This is a slightly hard picture to see, I'm afraid. Um, I should have worked harder. Um, the figure shows that most of the mortgages are fixed rate. Those are the gray and blue parts. Um, these are originations. We have very bad, turns out we have remarkably bad data on outstanding mortgages. Um, but we have data, we have fairly good data on originations, and so you have to sort of, you know, in your head kind of integrate or something like that. Um, there were a lot of adjustable rate mortgages prior to the financial crisis. Those have basically disappeared. That's the red line. Um, now, the, the, thing about, the thing about U.S. fixed rate mortgages is that they com contain an embedded refinancing option that the borrower pays for. Okay, and um, the borrower not in, not explicitly right. It's buried like everything else in the price. But um, the borrower can always choose to take out a new mortgage in order to repay, repay the existing one. But the decision on whether or not to do that is extremely complicated. 
Um, and it's, it's basically an option pricing decision. And I, I, uh, I challenge most of the people in the middle class to, to take such a decision um, in an informed way. And as a consequence, the presence of this option ends up creating a transfer from unsophisticated people to sophisticated people. Everybody pays for it. They pay the average price, basically, but only the people that know what they're doing exercise it and get the benefits. So there's a transfer going on here. Um, and, um, and I think that that's not a very good thing. We should not be in the business of encouraging contracts where we're transferring wealth from unsophisticated to sophisticated people. <laughs> Um, now, it's important to point out also that the government subsidizes mortgages, so we're encouraging people to borrow to acquire houses. Is this a smart thing to do? Um, does universal home ownership make sense? Everybody talks about the American dream, how great it is to own homes, but uh, or is it like student loans where we're at, where we're where we're uh, offering people options that are actually a disservice? Um, I grant that that's difficult to know. I mean, a, a house is definitely a hedge against fluctuations in the cost of housing services. I need a roof. I need to live somewhere. It's good to have a bathroom and a kitchen. I've always liked running water. Um, but it's, it, it's leverage that's, that's in, a leveraged investment that's quite risky. So to give you some sense of how risky it is, um, some people at the New York Fed got a hold of uh, of some very detailed data on homeowners and their uh, and their portfolios and did a stress test. They asked the following question in 2017: How many people would be underwater on their mortgages if home prices fell to the 2013 level? Okay, so it's 2017. You're asking about 2013. So this is not a draconian thing, okay, by any stretch of the imagination. But they know exactly where these people are, okay? And so the U.S. average is that 21% of people would be underwater. Uh, those are states along there, if you want to know. Nevada and Florida, are the, they're the champions. I don't think anybody would be terribly surprised. California is pretty important in part because it's so large, but it's the next, it's the next, uh, it's over on the right. Arizona also another champion. Um, so, um, so those I think are uh, California's twenty three percent, which of course is a big weight in that. Uh, some places are it's not so bad, but um, but those numbers look to me to be pretty bad. So when it comes to housing, I think to help people make smart decisions. First of all, we need simpler, smarter mortgages. Um, I would write mortgages with automatic refinancing built into them. Fixed rate mortgages that automatically refinanced. Um, it's also probably the case, given the risk that people are facing, that there should be more mortgages written that aren't mortgages in the normal sense, but involved equity participation in the, in the home. So you would only own a fraction of your home, but somebody else would own some of it um, and then there would there might be a loan associated with that um, as well, and that could substitute. You could substitute equity subsidies, which we have through the through the government sponsored entities, and are quite large for uh, for for debt subsidies. Um, in addition, I think we should think very hard about whether we should be promoting universal home ownership, um, or whether or not again we're just fueling distress. Um, in a in a significant number of uh, in significant number of people, um, my final example is um, is uh, about retirement saving. I'm sorry, I'm going on for too long. Uh, okay, I'll, st I'll I'll be I'm almost done. Um, okay, um, this this picture here shows two things. Um, first, the percentage of people who have some sort of pension plan, which is the right scale and the red line, has been rising, uh, has been rising pretty uh, pretty steadily, but still is only at something uh, in in the mid 40s or low 40s. I'm sorry, percent of the people. The more troubling thing, from my perspective, about this picture is the relative size of the two parts. So the gray part are defined benefit plans, and the blue part are defined contribution plans. So there's been a big shift in the last, uh, in the last 40 years 
away from defined benefit plans and towards defined contribution plans. Now you might say, well, why has that been happening and stuff? Um, and, uh, and, and part of this, of course, is, uh, is it's not unrelated to the decline in unions. It's not unrelated to the decline in, in large manufacturing uh, firms that offered defined benefit plans, which they then couldn't afford. Um, and, uh, and it's also related to the changes in the tax code that encourage people to have defined contribution plans. Um, but remember, if you have a defined contribution plan, then, um, then you're forced to make a lot of decisions. Okay? So the first thing you have to decide is how much do you want to save while you're working. Defined benefit plans that give you a fixed fraction of your final salary basically do this for you. It's, it's done automatically. But in a defined contribution plan, it's not. You have to decide. Then... The most, the most fun thing is you have to decide how to invest those savings while they're accumulating, okay? So remember back to how much information, remember back to the financial literacy questions now, right? How much do the people really understand about this? And third, then you have to decide how to manage the withdrawals when you do retire. A totally non-trivial problem, okay? Um, now, to get some sense of the challenge, this is probably not worth the trouble, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, to get, give some sense of the challenge that individual, individual, uh, individuals face, I did a bunch of calculations. And um, this is one part of it. So imagine that somebody works from age 23 to 68, has the goal of replacing 40%, 40% of their final working ink salary, the idea being that Social Security is going to finance another 40% for the median household, which is about what it does. Does. You invest in a bond, an, a, in something like a target date uh, mutual fund that starts with 90% equity when you're young and ends with one third equity, and the other part is bonds when you're old. So it's slowly shifting, um, the accumulation is slowly shifting in its investment. Um, and then let's, let's say that you want to make sure that you have at least a 5% um, chance of, uh, of surviving to, if you're going to be 90 years old and not running out of money. Okay? So if you look at the black line, the black solid line, that's the, the probability of exhaustion is on the left. Um, for a 90-year-old in the black line, you can also look at 80 and 100-year-olds if you want, um, and, the, and the dashed line is 5%. So that number, that number is over 15% per year is what you have to save, okay? So that's what you have to save if you're on your own and you want a 5% probability of, you want a 95% probability of not running out of money when you're 90 years old. Okay, this is all, a re this is all, these are all simulations and, and they have to do with like, you know, simul you, you have to assume stuff about the distribution of equity returns and interest rates and all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, but one of the things I can, in fact, still do in my old age is write little programs that do that. So, right, so that's what this is. Now, the problem here is that this person our proto-person who is retiring at age 68 faces two risks when they retire. They face longevity risk, which is part of what I'm focusing on here, right? That's the risk that you're going to live a long time and outlive your saving. And you also face a certain kind of what I would call market risk, which is that you are either lucky or unlucky both during your lifetime or on the day or, or during your retirement with what the returns look like, okay? So, I mean, just imagine a case of somebody who retired in, 2000 and, uh, in 2009, for instance, uh, they, they had experienced some pretty bad returns just before they retired. The first of these is pretty easy to handle. It's handled through annuities, through annuitization. Um, you can pull the longevity risks then within a cohort and you can take care of that. Market this market risk is something that, that, that's quite different. Here you need to pool across generations. It's much more complicated to do. Um, and, uh, and that means that whoever it is that's running this pool has to live for a, like a really, really long time, like for generations. Um, but if you can do that, in the first case, you can cut this significantly. 
Okay, the longevity risk actually cuts it in half about. And the, and the market risk cuts it further. You can get it down well below 10%, probably close to 5 uh, for, for, the, for the targets that I have. My target's not very ambitious, okay? I'm trying to replace 40% of, uh, of, uh, of, of, your, of your final income. So what can we do about this? Well, there are a few things that we can do. First of all, we have to make sure that people actually do continu continue to contribute. Right, that's like really important. Um, a lot of people aren't contributing even when they should. They should do it from the first day that they're working. We also need to promote diversification. There's been a lot of there's been a big move in this direction. In fact, in uh, in Dodd Frank, there was a there was a, a move to restrict choice among defined contribution pension plans, and so now a lot of people are actually are in target date funds. That's a very good thing. Um, I think the other thing that we really need to do, though, is we need to make sure that people annuitize when they, do, when, they, when they do retire. And the problem there is that private sector annuities provided by primarily insurance companies are very, very poorly priced. Um, and, uh, and, and so while I may tell everybody that they should get annuities, they're going to come, the, the right question is, well, where am I supposed to get one that's actuarially fair or even close? And the answer, I think, here is that if the government had a default program, it could encourage somehow better pricing. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what we don't want to do, um, since people don't seem to get this, we have to make sure that they know that we figure out some way to keep them from from um, from in, from investing in their own employer's equity. They've got enough at stake in their company to have their retirement stuck in it too. Um, uh, this is this is of course with the exception of the senior executives who should have all of their wealth in their firm's equity in order to in order to take care of the uh, principal agent problems. But that's another that, that that's a different problem. That's not who I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a, a median person. Okay, um, and. Um, and, and we also need to make sure, since I was assuming that 40% of people's income was actually going to be replaced by Social Security, that Social Security is, uh, is stabilized. So to, um, to summarize, uh, I think that we can do a number of things to help people make smarter financial decisions. Um, all of these involve certain aspects uh, of restricting choice for most people. But if you're a really sophisticated person, you can go off and do whatever you want. But we do have to we do have to face the fact that we're going to have to find ways to restrict decisions, and um, and and these involve restricting education decisions and our willingness to lend to certain people. Uh, trying to provide smarter contracts as defaults. The same has got to be true for housing, um, and, the, and and as well as uh, as well as for retirement. So um, to conclude, um, as we think about finance, um, we need to address the questions that I started with. How can we help people make smarter financial decisions? How can we reduce conflicts of interest, fraud, and uh, deception? And how can we ensure that cost reductions um, uh, accrue to customers? Uh, let, me, uh, let me close by thanking Adam and, uh, and the OK family for inviting me uh, to speak with you today. And thank you all for coming to listen. On is good. Um, thank you all very much, but mostly thank you, Steve. That was terrific, I, I feel. Um, very practical, very empirical, very honest. Uh, all things that I appreciate, our audience appreciates. I know John Olkay would have appreciated. Can we, we have a number of distinguished folks in the audience who can post questions as Usual, this is on the record. There's a roving mic up front in Jessica's hand. There's a standing mic. People should just identify themselves when they wish to ask a question or make a comment. Let me just start off with a, a perhaps a little bit of a, a provocation. We 
let's say we completely stipulate to everything you say. Um, and frankly, I would for the most part. Um, but you were involved at a very high level with the FSB, the G20, various national supervisors and regulators during and in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis. To what extent is there any hope of having this stuff implemented? And since it hasn't yet been implemented, what do you think is going on? Is it, is it really just simply there's just too much money at stake and people won't look after the consumer in that environment? Is it our libertarian ideology that hides within every economist and it's all the economist's fault? Is it lack of international coordination, so there's a race to the bottom? I mean, wh where does the resistance to doing all these things that you want to do come from? So I think that um, much of what I was talking about, again, as I said at the beginning, is, is very US-centric. Yeah. Um, the international standards are really about trying to ensure that financial systems <laughs> Um, around the world are are relatively uh, are relatively uh, resilient. Um, I think that there were a number of mistakes there, um, and uh, to give you some sense, that w when I was mentioning the fact that the regulatory burden was so high, yeah. um, I think that 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 regulatory burden. I'll give you just one sort of silly example. Um, banks have to meet. Um, have to meet five separate capital requirements uh, computed slightly different ways, plus this, these things called stress tests, which are just another version of a risk-weighted capital requirement. So, so they're meeting like all these different capital requirements. It's, it's not clear to me why you need five. It's true for you know, liquidity requirements. We sort of, I think that, that we, we, there's this, I was in the New York Fed on Monday talking about this problem, and I said, you know, it's as if every every office in the New York Fed has somebody different in it writing a different regulation and they're not talking to each other. So I think, but I, I'm, I'm, up, I'm a little bit more optimistic about that problem. So the problem of overburdening, um, overburdening people with regulations and, and helping to balance innovation and resilience, um, I think is, is, um, is good. We're, we're moving in the right direction there. A number of the problems that I was talking about, I think that, um, first of all, I think that we're not, we have not been focused enough as a profession on what it is that individuals are capable of. I think that that is improving. And so I have a little bit more optimistic about that. But every single thin, thing that I talked about, and I mean, you know, we're, I'm, in the, I'm in the political center of the United States, has vested interests that are very, very powerful. Um, and so I think we have, to, we have to, as much as we possibly can, push back. Um, and, uh, and I think that you know, we have a problem that recently the Department of Education uh, came out with uh, changes in regulations associated with, uh, with student borrowing that basically go in the wrong direction, OK? Um, but uh, so that's not good. But at the same time, even the last administration, you know, you ask yourself, what was the purpose of this complex fiduciary rule for uh, for financial um, for financial advisors? Was this to protect them, <laughs> uh, you know, from potential uh, from potential actions by their customers? So that they say, oh, but I, you know, like I, I was acting, I, you know, I'm meeting the requirements. So I'm protected, right? Or was it really something that, uh, that was going to change culture? So I think that, I, I think that it's a, I think it's a huge problem. The vested interests are a problem. And we just have to keep, uh, we just have to keep up the, keep up the volume. Um, another question quickly, um, sort of taking more back to the economics side. One of the things you pointed out early that various people, You've been playing a role in this. Various of us have talked about this. And there was a debate, which some of our colleagues like Bill Klein and Morris Goldstein were involved with as well, is you know, how much finance is too much finance? What are the benefits right. of finance? So right. let me put a, right. since you've contributed to that, let me put a bit of a different spin on that. It looks like you know, we, we've had, as you say, enormous financialization, enormous financial so-called innovation, no change in the in the price of intermediation, and this hasn't exactly been a period of booming productivity growth. We, 
So where does, if you step back as you did several years ago when there was this, the first round of this debate came around, where does that stand now? I mean, is, is, there, is there a golden goose to be killed or is it only a green painted rubber ducky? <laughs> Well, it's probably somewhere in between, but the, the, uh, I still believe that, um, that, that financial systems get too large and that financial systems largely can, can in fact suck resources out of economies in ways that are counterproductive. Um, my, my, favorite, my favorite sort of story about this is that um, when, I was a, when, I, when I was an MIT undergraduate, which was before I got the ATM card, so it was in the middle 1970s, wow. I, the, when I was an MIT undergraduate, my classmates, not me, I wasn't any good at this stuff, but my classmates wanted to do stuff like cure cancer or create room temperature superconductors or fly to Mars, okay? Seems pretty good. Right, none like, of which have happened yet. None of by which. The way. Well, but you know they're still working on it, and their successors are some of them are working on it. But the problem is that many of their successors and my successors, by the 1990s, everybody wanted to be a hedge fund manager. This cannot be a good thing. Okay, this is a this was a shift in the use of resources that I think was not good. So I think there's I think that for for me uh, again people differ in their interpretation, but I am convinced that. Financial systems get too large and become a drag on economies, and financial systems that grow too quickly also can become a drag on economies, and that we've seen a lot of that. So the Dutch disease, New York disease. The Dutch disease. disease of finance. So Mike, at, at the, Mike, at the Mike back, Mike, Mike, and then over there, Jessica, please. Thank you, Mike Prell. Uh, Steve, you are undoubtedly uh, as well-versed in the debate about uh, inflation targets for monetary policy and the, the stabilization issue. Uh, you've also just shown us a considerable sensitivity to the question of people's ability to reckon with inflation and the effects on their finances. Right. How do you weigh these? How would you bring that question of retirement, uh, security, longevity risks, and so on right. uh, with inflation into, into this uh, issue? Right. Um, yeah, thanks, Mike. That, that's a. I think that's a great. That's a great question. And um, and what what makes it what makes it so I think important is the that I I am convinced that people don't understand inflation very well, and since they do need to plan for their retirements over very long time horizons, that inflation can be very damaging to that ability to plan. And so um, I've always been very much in favor of something like a 2% inflation target. And the 2% inflation target that I know we used to discuss many years ago, um, that that target, if we think that it's for you know, current measurement, we think measurement's a little bit biased. So in fact, real inflation that people are facing are maybe something like 1%. And 1% suggests that prices are doubling over something that's even a bit longer than a working lifetime. I think people can handle that. I think raising inflation targets, I think there are a lot of reasons not to raise inflation targets beyond this. But the one that you point out that's related to what I'm talking about today, I think is also quite compelling. And that is that if I were to raise inflation targets to 3 or 4%, now all of a sudden people have to understand that they need to demand higher levels of uh, re higher returns and they have to understand what that means for the withdrawals that they're going to make when they're actually retired. Um, and that the difference between a fixed nominal annuity and an inflation indexed annuity becomes a real thing even over 15 or 20 years. So I think that I think that that's that's another thing for the list on why we need you know sort of price stability. Uh, Jacob Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute. Um, <clears throat> just a little anecdote to begin with. Um, my father, uh, who admittedly doesn't live in in the United States, he was recently he recently took out a personal mortgage with a negative interest rate. 
Uh, but he was also charged uh, negative uh, interest rates on his bank deposits, or at least some of them. Um, and so there is an interest rate margin there somewhere still, but I would, I would venture that it probably should change uh, his savings and investments behavior. So my question to you is, going through the three categories that you had, you know, education, housing, and retirement, if you think about a world uh, that I think we probably all increasingly live in, we can debate whether the natural interest rate is above or below zero, but interest rates are much, much lower than they used to be. Uh, maybe not quite as low as in Denmark, but nonetheless. How, how should we think about a world uh, with virtually no interest rates in the context of your three uh, decisions? Um, I guess, so, well, the, the, the sort of cheap answer, <laughs> the cheap answer is we've had negative real rates for a lot of my lifetime. It's hard. The fact that people don't understand negative numbers is not, is sort of, it seems weird to me that we suddenly go from negative real rates, which we've had for so many years, to negative nominal rates, which then represent just negative real rates that are slightly different. In fact, the negative real rates today turn out to be way higher, which is to say closer to zero, than the negative real rates that we experienced during much of the, certainly almost the entire decade of the 70s in most of the advanced world, and also during much of the 1980s. Um, so, so the first thing is that we have seen stuff like this in the past. Um, my simulation experiments have that data in it. Um, but I think that the, the problem that you're pointing out is, um, the problem that you're pointing out is, is twofold, right? One of them is that people are, in fact, really upset by negative interest rates. Um, I, I, I don't read German, but I read enough of the, of, of the translations to know what's going on. Um, I think that, I don't know, the, the Danish press, I'm not, um, I, I don't know. I don't know whether they have the same reactions. My guess is not quite. My my Danish friends are more sane. But um, oh, I'm not supposed to say stuff. You're like that, supposed probably. to say whatever you want. But, um, I'm not supposed but, to. Say but um, <laughs> but anyway. So so I, I think that um, you know. I think that um, I think that the that the fact that real returns are lower just just. It, there are two things that are adding to the problem. Real returns are lower, longevity is increasing. It means that saving rates, if you're going to smooth consumption over your lifetime, are actually going to have to be higher. That means that permanent consumption levels are actually going to have to fall, and this is really a tough sell. Um, but I'm not sure it's, I'm, not, I'm just not sure it's escape, that we can escape it. Um, so my basic answer is too bad. Um, that's life. Live with it. Um, and let's try not to uh, have people get unnecessarily spooked by it. Right, even though right, exactly. I mean, I think that the fact that I, I take seriously, you know, again, as an economist, like I come in and say, geez, you know, like, what it, what's your problem with zero? Like, why below zero, above zero? Or why are you so upset at below zero? I have to accept the psychological fact that people are upset by below zero and, um, and figure out, how to counter that. I think that's the issue. But the real thing is, you know, working lives are going to have to, we're going to have to figure out a way to, to have longer working lives for people, higher saving rate for people. We have to figure out, I, I'm, I'm just not the person to do this, but people are going to have to have more transitions in their, in their working life careers. They're going to have to figure out how to be trained to do things when, you know, when at least you know, half the Italian population is retired at that age. But, um, but I, uh, you know, so I, I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem. Um, oh, suddenly now we have questions that we're running out of time. Okay. Oh, Could no, the well, two of you go. at that table both go to the standing mic and too long. pose your questions? I'll Mike and Gary. I'll be quicker. No, no, you're fine. They're the problem. Um, I'll be quicker. I'll take both questions at once if okay. both of you could I'll, I'll go to notes. the mic. Uh, my name is Mike Gadbo. I'm with Georgetown Law School. Um, you, I, my question is about malfeasance and ethics. And like a lot of the people who have given this lecture, you're not particularly um, receptive to ethics, uh, which I think of as the ultimate self-regulation. You, like Stan Fisher and a lot of others, like the prosecution model, 
but don't think it's working to put enough people in jail. But as an economist, I wonder if you've thought about the costs of the prosecution model, uh, which are actually very high. It's very transactional, very individual. You have to find the evidence. You have to persuade a jury um, versus the systemic costs of a systemic ethical model that, I mean, to use an analogy, would keep the bad apples out of the barrel or get the bad apples out of the barrel when they start to rot before they destroy the barrel. Sorry, so Mike, I wonder, in, in, in non-agricultural terms, what would that actually entail? Ethical codes of conduct developed by market participants and enforced by market participants which is what Mark Carney suggested in oh, a Jesus panel on Christ. the future of ethics and finance four years ago. Do you want to take one? <laughs> yeah, please, Steve. Oh, you, were, you said you were going to take two. I, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm big, Gary, no, no, I'm, do you want to? Gary? I, I think that, no, 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 that's um, good. I, yeah, here, Gary. Oh, oh, I have a very simple question. Reparations are very much in the political dialogue today. Reparations, you've heard about that. Reparations? For, reparations for African Americans and oh, slaves. Oh, oh, oh. Well, okay. Well, how about reparations for these education, housing, retirement for all these, uh, you know, these uh, evils that have been put upon people by the financial system? Okay, so we've gone from the ethical model to the reparations model. Um, um, we'll come to Anna last, um, but please. Okay, I, I guess the the um, on the question of whether or not. <coughs> whether or not people will self-police establishing principles and then living up to them. Um, I would love to live in a world like that. Um, and and I, would, I would hope that it could work, but I don't see it working. Um, so maybe the question isn't, isn't whether we, it, I mean, I would like to, if somebody has a proposal for how to get people to actually behave that way, uh, I think that would be fine. But what I see instead is people, people trying to hide their behavior in the financial system, people using complexity and opacity to hide behavior. I think that's, and I think there's a natural tendency to do that. Um, now, I, I, accept, <coughs> I accept that putting people in jail is, um, is costly. Um, it's a cost that in this country, I think we're probably a little bit too willing to pay for violent crimes or even some nonviolent crimes. But <clears throat> I think a small move in that direction might not be so bad. So I really want to know why the executives at, in, uh, at Wells Fargo that were there, that were <clears throat> supposedly overseeing this behavior that was clearly fraudulent, why they're walking around free. I think that's something, I, I don't think you have to do a lot of this, but, um, but some of it would be fine. Um, you know, <clears throat> after, in the, the people in the Nixon administration, we put a bunch of them in jail. I think it helped. Uh, maybe you don't, but I do. Um, as, for, as for Gary's question, <clears throat> um, I, think that, I think that grants are, um, you know, gr grants are great, but they don't, this is also, there's also a, there also have been some proposals for debt forgiveness. I think that, um, that, first of all, as I suggested, I think if you just give grants, the question is whether or not the benefits are going to go to the people who you really give them to or whether they're just going to drive prices up. The second thing is if you do debt forgiveness, it's pretty clear that the, that the biggest debts are currently held by people who go to graduate and professional schools and, um, and then probably have the highest earning potential. So it's not clear that the distributional, the distributional properties of that are right. I think the, the, the more to the point is that if you have these income contingent contracts where people, where you ask people to pay a certain fraction of their income per month um, for a certain number of years and then they're done, that seems to me to be uh, to be a, to be a more reasonable one. As for the reparations and all that other stuff, I, I have no I have no comment on that really. I, I'm just going to come in for a second. I think I think there is a connection, not intended and maybe a bit of a stretch, but I think there's a connection between Mike Gadbaugh and Gary Huffbauer's comments, which is I think from a prima facie ethical point of view as well as a political point of view, when there are large redistributions 
done without a vote, done through some kind of civil force, and it's visible to the public that after X number of years, those redistributions stand, you delegitimize the system. That's true of the fact that African Americans have been unable to accumulate wealth throughout the, throughout the decades. That's true, as Martin Wolf wrote about very articulately about it would have been good to put a few more people in jail. And so the argument, I think, Mike, is not so much about the practicalities or even the deterrent effects, although I think both of those are valid things to raise. I think it's a legitimacy argument. That, that if after decades we keep ending up with the same maldistributions, we don't get, we, we erode the belief in the system. And that, and that I think is a thing that perhaps it's due to economists, but I don't think it's by any means just due to economists that we're in that situation. Let me put in one advertisement um, before we conclude. Um, Steve mentioned very honestly uh, up front and very self-referentially, but I think applying to our profession, that most economists do have, or at least most mainstream economists do have this sort of libertarian streak. It goes back to utilitarian models that underlie the welfare functions that we, we maximize or we try to maximize. But there are economists trying to get beyond that, as Steve very well did today. Um, and I just want to note that the fifth, annual, fifth biannual Rethinking Macroeconomic Policy Conference will be taking place here in mid-October, October 16th, 17th, and the topic is about inequality, whether there are macroeconomic policy tools that actually should be invoked to deal with inequality. This effort's being led by Olivier Blanchard and Danny Roderick, and I would encourage, we're very proud that Peterson will, through the OK lecture and Steve's talk today, and also through the Rethinking Macro, we're trying to tackle some of these issues. So I hope you'll join us then. At the moment, I'd like to ask you to thank Steve Cicchetti, the fifth annual OK Lecture.